today I have my friend, John Shirley, and he is talking with us about all things church and worship and where he thinks the church is going today, all the stuff. So, um, John, hi. Hi, Janae, and hello, everyone out there in the core space world. I'm so, for real, I'm not, I'm not exaggerating here. You're one of my favorite people on this planet. So this is a huge privilege for me to be occupying this space with you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Well, thank you so much. And of course, you are one of my favorite people as well. So we're even. Um, so John, tell, so for folks who don't know you, um, tell us a little bit about yourself and what you've been doing in the ministry world for the past several years. Yeah, well, I, okay, so on the personal side, um, I'm 45 years old. The, the, those words are harder harder to get out of my mouth. Than <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, I, I, I have known you for a really long time, and I remember when you turned 40, like, we just didn't see you for a while. Right. <laughs> it was hard. I'm embracing it, I'm embracing it with joy. That's, that's, that's what God's doing in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's perfect. <laughs> so, yeah, so married to the, I mean, come on, like the most beautiful, charming woman that the Lord certainly has ever brought across my, my path. Somehow I, I wrestled that relationship into my life by the grace of God. I'm so blessed that Alyssa is my wife. Alyssa Shirley, we have three incredible kids. Reeve is eight. Beck is six and a half. Kezi is three, our little girl. The sweet and spice of our life. And yeah, we're um, living in Kansas City, Missouri. I work for a church called The Gathering Network, which is a church uh, that is a network of missional communities that hopefully, prayerfully, live in the way of Jesus. We'll see, you know, I believe that they're at least trying, which is awesome. And that's been, that's been kind of like a social and spiritual experiment for us that we've been on since about 2009. Um, I'm, a, I'm a worship leader by vocation in this young church plant, which means that I have on more hats than that. But um, it's, it's been interesting to be a worship leader in this missional, disciple-making church context that's maybe a little more uh, a, you know, left of center in terms of what's normal out there. So yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit about me and, and, uh, we, we can, we can maybe jump off from there. But, yeah. 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 Sure. So recently you started a new, um, podcast. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. It's the love and war worship podcast. It's springing out of, um, what will, you know, what we're believing will be, uh, <clears throat> a movement of sorts uh, of Jesus-shaped worship leaders, which is the language that we've um, borrowed from an author by the name of Bob Rongling, a friend of mine, who wrote a book called The Jesus-Shaped Life. And it's just this, uh, this premise that Jesus lived a life of love in three different directions. He loved God, he loved his disciples, and he loved people that were outside of the family of God. And... Um, so it would be like a three-dimensional life, 11, three directions. So the way that that kind of affects us culturally is, you know, a, a real desire and a real hope to raise up Jesus-shaped worship leaders that are different, maybe, maybe the effort there being different than living into this image of what we would call a modern worship leader persona mm. that has become so... Um, formative for young worship leaders today. I, I like to say that my dad, my dad was a Southern Baptist music pastor. So he wore a suit, waved his arms in front of our congregation. A uh, massive choir was behind him. No drums in the church. My generation came along, fought for drums in the church, huge fight, won that battle. Um, <laughs> and then there was this idea of like modern worship that sprung up through my generation. And now there's a generation behind me that is able to imagine a career path of worship leadership that would lead to an arena. And we're just focusing on that and going, that's, that's a lot that has happened over a span of about 20 or 30 years. 
Yeah. Things have changed so dramatically. And so we're just looking at it and going, what, what does that, what does that mean? A lot of that is what God is doing. And then there's this other part of it that is um, strange, you know? So it's, it's maybe like God is using a really strange thing, you know? Um, and we're just trying to ask some worship leaders who are ready to, to look at the life of Jesus and go, can he shape our life more than uh, the modern worship leader persona? Which one of them are, are, are shaping our lives right now? You know? Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that movement is a relational movement, a collection of worship leaders that are what we would call a new kind of worship leader, that they're ready to um, enter into ordinary spaces where a lot of the worship movement is really occupying really extraordinary places, and it should. Like, as much as there is room for something to be awesome and spectacular on the arena scale or even the mega church scale. We just really believe that God is stirring the heart of some leaders that are like, I, I love that. That has shaped me, but I'm the fruit of that. And now uh, I, I am wanting to occupy more insurgent places, like take worship into ordinary places, into neighborhoods. What would it look like if worship was like rising out of my living room? What would that mean for my neighbors who are experiencing a divorce or um, uh, the, our, our neighbors across the street who, you know, she just died of Alzheimer's? You know, what, what, what does worship and prayer mean in the context of a more domestic uh, environment? So that was long, but that's kind of what love and war is. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that is revolutionary. Um, it really, most of the worship leaders and people that I know are on a stage, all of that stuff. And so this new generation, a new type of worship leader is kind of refreshing. And I really believe that it's kind of what we need <laughs> at this time in our lives, you know? So, yeah. Well, I appreciate that because half the time we, you know, we, we sit around looking at each other going, are we, are we crazy? Are we alone? I don't know. I can't tell <laughs> how it feels. So it's certainly not big. It's certainly not widespread, but it's what we feel the Lord calling us to. Right yeah. yeah. So, um, so what does that look like? So I know that you do um, kind of, I don't think they're called retreats, but you do kind of uh, have people come into your home and you teach yeah. them how to do this. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah. So those are what we would call learning communities. And um, that's the big call. You know, the podcast was, was really that. It was really an effort to fish, really, to say, hey, are there other worship leaders that are asking these kind of questions? And, and there were. There, there was a, 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 quite a a handful of worship leaders that were ready to talk about that, about this kind of stuff, about how to use their life beyond the stage. You know, how, how do I, how do I live a life beyond Sunday that really has a lot of meaning? So as we put that call out there through the podcast, some people started to come to it. We put these learning communities together, which are, they happen twice a year. They happen in Kansas city. They happen in my home and now in other homes around Kansas city. But, um, yeah, the gist of that is like, come into my, come into my life, come into my family. And that's really what discipleship is. It's saying, come, come be with me, you know, come be with me, come be at my table with my family and be here with us for four days. And we're going to teach some stuff. But beyond that, our spiritual family, what we would call our missional community is going to come around you. We're going to lay hands on you and pray for you. And we're going to create space for you to process what God is saying to you as you hear some of these thoughts and ideas, which are really probably externalizing what you already feel. And so as those things come to surface, we're just here to say, okay, what's God saying to you? And then how, how can we help you, you know, get at that in life? And then in the evening times, we do these, you know, big nights of worship and prayer and it's and, and these big elaborate meals and it's just heavenly, honestly, to be real honest with you. It feels like this is right. This feels so right. You know? Wow. Wow. <laughs> you know? you want to jump on a plane and come to see you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, come on. 
So how do you think that we can adapt some of these things that you guys are learning? How can we adapt them in like other places in ministry? So, you know, um, I did creative ministry for many, many years. How do you think I can, I could have adapted that what yeah. you were doing through mine? Well, it, you know, a lot of that has to do with context and it has a lot to do with system. So we, you know, we tell people a lot of times because for instance, we get a lot of worship leaders that, uh, they, they actually get here and they're pretty discouraged. You know, they're like, man, I'm, I work in this church. I lead worship seven times a week at these different things that are going on. There's 10,000 people in my church. No one at my church has ever laid hands on me and prayed for me. This is the first time that's ever happened here in my house. <laughs> and then secondly, I've never been in my pastor's home, you know, but I, but I lead teams. They're like, but I lead all of these teams and I have all these people, but I don't, like I have people around me, but I don't have relationships. I don't have, I don't feel like I belong. I feel like I'm, 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 I'm working, but I don't really belong to it. So we're, we just try to, to just get them to use the ingredients of their life to make of their life what God is asking them to make of their life. And so right in front, we're like, what's the life that God is asking you to live? That's first. That thing should be indicating that should be the thing that is, that is, um, that is helping you make just simple choices in the way that you live. Every other decision should come after the life that you feel God is asking you to live. And we keep saying all the time, you probably can't change your system because you don't have that kind of weight as a worship leader, but you can change your life. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the day, Jesus will probably not ask you about your system. Like he's not like when you stand before him, he's not going to be like, Hey, let's talk about the system that you worked in. He's going to ask you about your life. And so, um, your system may not even be asking you to live like Jesus. They might just be asking you to deliver on Sunday. That's a thing. You know what I mean? Like it's so possible to work in a church system that no one in it is saying, are you going to live like Jesus? What's your plan to live a Jesus shaped life? They're like, Hey man, if you need to confess some sin and pull over and, you know, do that over here, we're going to apply some grace to it or we're going to, pep you up, but kill it on Sunday, man. You can do it. His mercies are new for you. And that's good. All of that is true, but it turns the worship leader into a commodity and not a person that's actually trying to like really live into Jesus. And so we would say to them, like, if you see anything on the buffet of what we're talking about that you want in your life, then A, you have to take responsibility for it. Then you have to start building rhythms into your life that allow you to touch those things regularly. And if you're going to use the ingredients that you have, look at the team you have and think of team, not like team, but like family. So change the team dynamic to family dynamic. And that doesn't happen overnight. That happens over a period of years. It takes a long, long time. And it starts when you just start to disciple one or two of them at the core. And it's a real tight relational, you know, system that then just like Jesus said, it's a little bit of yeast that starts to infect the whole dough. And typically what's happening, you know, in most of our worship ministries and church, you know, creative teams and stuff like that, we're task oriented, we're management oriented, and leadership has become more about management than it has become about relationships. And so we're just trying to coach people. How can you become relational again? Like, like in your leadership style, how can you become a relational person again? Uh, and an emotionally healthy leader at that, that can look at the people that you're working with and say, I'm glad to be with you. You know, I'm glad to be with you. And I think you're probably glad to be with me and, let's not let the problems of this whole thing be bigger than the relationships that we have right now. Let's, let's just be together <laughs> and, uh, and, and work it out. You know what I'm saying? So I would say at the end of all that, I would say it's having people look at the ingredients of their life and then just turn that toward family, you know, spiritual family together.
Yeah, that's super practical. Like you can use that today. Oh my gosh. So when you say disciple, what does that look like for you when you guys are doing that? What is like, you know, kind of, what's the first thing you do? Because I mean, to me, I mean, I've been in church work for a really, really long time. And um, it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I understood what discipling meant. Um, Isn't that weird? Because the same thing happened to me. That was the same thing for me. I've had a couple of different conversions in my life. Like the first one was when I got, you know, saved. The other one was when I like studied Jesus and I'm like, wow, didn't know you. And then, <laughs> and then there was a Holy spirit one that was like, that's awesome. And then this whole deal about discipleship, which was like, I've never, I never knew that. I never, never knew that that was really the call was to make disciples. So I'm with you on that. Yeah. yeah. Blew my, it blew my mind. Um, so tell, yeah, tell me, tell me more about what you guys, you know, your team, what they do and what you guys have been doing. Yeah. Well, fundamentally, um, I, you know, I think the discipleship is a relational enterprise, you know, it's a relational concept. Um, I would differentiate myself from a leader that would, that would consider, you know, I, I do think that there's a form of discipleship. There's a type of discipleship, maybe a level of discipleship or a measure of discipleship that happens when hundreds of people are in a room together, hundreds or thousands. There's a, you know, clearly truth is going out um, and people are hearing it, but that would call that a passive form of discipleship. Jesus model for us was a more fully engaged I mean, it doesn't get more engaged than Jesus' form of discipleship, which was come be with me, come travel with me. You know, those guys were camping out together. They were traveling together. They were um, in some really sticky situations together. Jesus was doing all these miracles all the time and blowing their minds and asking them, what do you think about that? They were kind of falling in and out of faith. I mean, it was this crazy little tribe, you know. And at the core of that was this sense that when, as he was with them and as things were happening, God was saying something, you know? And so, I mean, for real, like if you're with someone and he picks up dirt and spits in it for a while and then puts it on some blind guy's eyes, you know, and then wipes it away or says, go wash your eyes and that guy can see again. That's something that, that happened. You know, that's like a thing, you know, <laughs> you have to talk about it. <laughs> I'll just be like, Hey, that was nasty. Like that was why that, like, can, can we say that? Can, why did you think I should pick up some dirt and a spit in it? That's, and then make mud, which takes a long time to do. Long time and a lot of spit. In a lot of spit. And, it, and like, like if I saw a pastor do this one time in a sermon, he picked up dirt and he spit in it for the whole sermon to prove how long it take. It took 30 minutes for it to turn into mud. You know? One, <laughs> one that's gross that he did that. Right. That's and gross. So here Jesus is like spending this long time with this person, wipes it on his eyes. The guy's sight comes back. And all of that is worth talking about. I mean, God is saying stuff all over all of that, you know, like all of that. And so um, discipleship is just noticing as people noticing that there are these things that are happening in their lives, you know, from reading the Bible to being in prayer and having the sense that God is speaking or their marriage is in trouble and God is speaking. Or it's like going, okay, across the, across the, the spectrum of your life, God is saying stuff to you. Where do you feel that the most in a relationship, helping people mine that out? And then just on the other end of that, it's, you know, you know, I guess the the strong way to say it would be like, what's God saying? What are you going to do about it? But I think maybe the more vulnerable and and empathetic way would be like, God is speaking to you. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Can you hear it? You know, let's see how he's speaking to you. And then secondly, how can we help you walk toward that breakthrough? Because when he's speaking to us, he's speaking to us about who we are and who we can become and, you know, what he's calling us to do in, in life. And so 
how we can partner with him in ministry. So it's like, what, what, what is God saying? How is he getting your attention? And then how can we help you lay hold of that, you know, in your life? Ultimately it's your responsibility, but how can we help you, you know? And uh, yeah. So at the core of it, you know, what's God saying? What are you going to do? Jesus is King and he's speaking to you, you know, and then we're receiving that. And those words are valuable. They have weight and, you know, they're treasures to us. And so how do we value the word of the Lord and respond to it? How do we respond to what our King is saying in grace? I, th- I think that that's really what discipleship is over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So for the average church person, church worker, or, you know, or ministry person, what, um, how can they make room to do this? <laughs> because I feel like discipleship, you know, is, is a lot. It's a, it's, you're, you're, it's a lot. It's our call, but then you have your job. So how can you make room in your, you know, outside of your ministry life or inside your ministry life to make this kind of, you know, happen? Totally. So one of your listeners were like, man, that, how can I respond to this that we're talking about right now? You know, um, cause Jesus clearly told us that this is the call of every single believer, you know, and, and like, in, in my own life, I, when I saw it, I was like, dang, because the problem here is that I'm going to be bad at that. Like, I'm, I'm going to be obviously terrible at that until I'm, good, until I'm better at that, you know? And so right upon hearing that call, it was kind of answering that, you know, can I do this? Do I have what it takes? And the answer is no, but Jesus has what it takes to do it through me, you know? And so let's start that journey. So I would go, okay, if somebody really wanted to go after this philosophically, that what I just said, okay, no, you don't have what it takes, but he has what it takes to do it through you. That's the crux of the gospel. That's actually what it means to be someone who follows Jesus. So there's that. Then just going, okay, I want this to be a part of my life, but now it becomes an issue of like external problems. It's like about time. Time and where your life is spent, you know, basically. And when we're talking about that, what we do in our curriculum is we just have people do a stop start thing. We're going, okay, what you can't do, it's like Christmas with my kids. It's like if a toy comes in, a toy's got to go out, you know, Lord have mercy. (laughs) We did not do that this year. And oh my goodness, I wish we had. (laughs) Oh, oh, we haven't done it yet. And I'm (laughs) fucking nutty. It's like if one comes in, one's got to go out. Yes. With these things, like with these things, something like discipleship, we're going, I want to leverage my life relationally for the sake of the kingdom and answer God's call. Well, when that comes in, other stuff has to come out. And so that could mean a lot of things. That could mean that you have to sit, if you're married, you sit down with your spouse, you literally get the place where we start this is we get a blank calendar, just 30 squares. And we have people write down, this is where, this is what we do. Every day of the month, this is where we're going, and, and it's, it's amazing. People look at it to externalize it. They're like, we do a lot. We do a whole, whole lot, you know? And it's part of that response thing. If God is asking us to make disciples, then that's got to go somewhere. So what one thing is going to go so that this can come in? And, you know, discipleship making disciples it really does start there it's like a negotiation wrestling the life that god is asking you to live down to the mat Mm -hmm. is what it is and so if one thing's coming in one thing's got to go out and then you just put a place on the calendar for it to happen that works for you and then you just start to call people into your life who can do that with you wow wow that's beautiful i love it and a note on that too, just when it comes to calling people into it, call people into your life who are hungry for it, not people who you think have potential to be great at it. Call the people in your life, you're looking around and you're like, this person? If I asked, hey, who, who would put their hand up if they wanted, you know, come follow me into discipleship? Whoever it is, it's like, pick me, pick me, pick me, pick them, you know? Mm. Rather than the person who's like, oh man, I, I really want to disciple them. Pick the one that's got their hand in the air. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> that's a, that's a, that is a good word. <laughs> That's a good word. No, it's a good word. Um, okay, so let's switch gears a little bit. So uh, when you first started ministry, um, what's one thing you wish you knew that nobody told you? Okay, when I first started ministry, I wish that I knew – okay, when I first started ministry – I, I I'd kind of had some stuff already going, like uh, I'd already had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. So I kind of had this prayer thing, sort of this intimacy with God thing going. If I didn't have that, I would say that that's a big deal. You know, like a, like a, like an intimacy of prayer life that was kind of set in motion. Um, and then, you know, so my ministry life started when I was 20, when I was 29 years old is when I studied Jesus for the first time. 27. When I was 27 is when I studied Jesus for the first time. Wow. And, um, and I mean, I had been to like Bible school, my like, like, uh, Sunday school, my whole life leader in my youth group, Bible school in college, got all the way through it, had never studied the life of Jesus seriously. And, and when I did, I was like, okay, see my life doesn't look anything like your life, like nothing like your life. Like that's what is going on, you know? And so I would say if somebody's starting ministry, learn their rhythms and behaviors from Jesus. Like, like literally study him, um, <clears throat> study him to the degree that like, <clears throat> you're so popular. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, like, my wife gone. <laughs> Why do I even have that hooked to my computer? <laughs> um, no, I would say study him so much that there's, you know, read large volumes of the New Testament over and over and over again to the degree that, like, you get this sense that you're walking with him, you know? I got, I mean, I remember, like, in those days, like, reading these stories about Jesus over and over and over again so much that I, I kind of had this, like, textual, um, tactile feeling, like, man, I feel like I can like feel his robe brush past me or something. It was just, just like a really in it, really in it, really meditating on it. And, you know, from there, just start to ask the questions that emerge, you know, because if you study the life of Jesus like that, questions are going to emerge and begin to process those, you know, mm. in prayer. So I would say get a real clear, clear image of who Jesus is, you know, and let your behaviors come out of that. Okay. Here's a couple of, well, we'll have two not so serious questions and then one like, you know, kind of big question maybe to kind of end it all. So what are you watching right now? What's, what are you, what are you guys watching? Ooh, that's good. Well, I mean, okay. So there's stranger things. There's that, right? Um, I'm loving this, uh, new David Letterman, uh, the new Netflix. David Letterman show the uh, for my next guest or whatever. Yeah, my next guest needs no introduction. Yeah. That went so good. Ah, Lee, I knew you would have seen it already. I of knew course, it. twice. The <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was just watching it. Just I kind of took ten minutes and watched like this little part of it again when he was interviewing you know Barack Obama. That um, mostly stuff, mostly Netflix stuff because we don't really do cable. We do all that you know in in the next flicks. Netflix world. Um, also, a show called Travelers. Alyssa and I started watching that the other day. It's also a Netflix show. Oh. Yeah. Is it good? You look like you don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, well, I'm, 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 I'm actually sitting here going, am I actually going to say out loud on your <laughs> podcast, I've been watching Gilmore Girls with her? Oh, well, you know what? There's no shame and there's no judgment. We well, still love you. <laughs> he says... That it's, you know, when she's just folding clothes, you know, like a, like a no brainer kind of show. But I kind of, it's Kirk. It's the guy. It's the Kirk. It's, he's funny and I like it. He's a funny <laughs> guy. Look at you. That's brave. Go for it. All right. There you go. So, okay. So now, uh, what are you reading? Ooh, yeah. Hmm. Reading books. Yeah. yeah, that's right. You're a dad of three. Do you even yeah. have time to do that? <laughs> it's like crazy. Let's give me a minute. Hmm. 
No, I, uh, I, we, we are reading a book right now that is just incredible. It's called Praying Circles Around Your Children um, by, uh, is it Mark Batterson? Mm-hmm. Is that his yeah, Mark Batterson. Uh, and I believe that that's the name of the book. Um, that, that one's just been, that one's been awesome. Braving the Wilderness by Brene Brown uh, is one. Uh, who's not reading that, right? Um, and then lastly, there's a, <laughs> there's, a, uh, there's a book called Sight Ship that has become um, like a near textbook for the stuff that we're doing. It's written by a guy named Chris McAllister. And so I went on sabbatical this summer and I always, it's always funny. Like I've been on a few sabbaticals and I'm always amazed at the very last book that's it's always like somebody just throws it at me it's like just ends up on the top deal and that ends up being the book you know that is like god uses to pretty much wreck me and that that was that was that one and uh yeah the premise of that book is that we have three gears in life you know um community mission or like second and third gear and we like to start there and you can start there so i don't know if you drive like a transmission car but like or a uh, like a manual transmission car, but on a hill you know, or on a flat surface, you can start it in second gear in community or mission. But if you're on any kind of incline, you got to go to first. And if you don't know how to go to first, you ain't going to get to community or mission. And that first gear is identity. And so it was, it was, it was really beneficial for me in a time like that, you know? Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's, That's good. good. That's really good. That preaches, doesn't it? That was so that- good. It really does preach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the last question is, uh, well, no, it's not the last one. So where do you think the church is headed right now? Where do you think kind of, you know, put your future hat on. Where do you think we're going? Oh man. Okay. Okay. Well, you really, you really want to do this? You Let's really go for it. Let's do it. Let's go for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right well um okay I, we could get kind of nerdy about this um and and certainly kind of prophetic about it i guess that would be up to interpretation i guess but uh oh man okay so 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 when we're talking about discipleship mission stuff we're really talking about the purpose of the church. You know, we're really talking about like the essence of, of, of what the church is and what the church is called to do, who we're called to be. And we keep talking about the church. Like it's an organization. It's not it's a family, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a family with a heart, you know, it's a family with a, with a call. And, um, and so a couple of years ago, I got wrecked, like absolutely wrecked thinking about the earliest, followers of Jesus. And we've all, you know, we all really romanticized that movement. It probably wasn't really romantic. It was really hard. It was a really hard place to be. They were all in this spot where they were just getting really persecuted and felt marginalized. And there's a lot of that that I think we identify with today, depending on where you're standing in evangelicalism. Well, <clears throat> If a lot of our behaviors, if a lot of our rhetoric in evangelicalism is sounding panicky, you know, uh, maybe um, maybe uh, we feel like we're under our environment and not over it, you know, uh, if we feel like things are happening to us, not because of us politically or socially or whatever. Well, then, that, then we get to kind of examine like what Christianity has become and what space it is we're trying to occupy. So the, these earliest followers of Jesus that were profoundly influential, even in a culture that really didn't like them too much, a culture that marginalized them and hated them, but they still lived the kind of life that people wanted to live. That's how it grew. It grew dramatically and wildly until Constantine basically set it up in the middle of town and Christendom started. And that has really been in motion until like maybe you know the 50s or 60s. Probably about the 60s is where you know 
sociologists would tell us that Christendom started to come to an end. And right about that time, we started to see um, the emergence of the religious right, um, real conservative-based movements. Um, the church grew more towards a political uh, angle. And a lot of that was because we're trying to hang on to the dominant seat of influence culturally, you know? And so what gets co-opted when we do that is what got co-opted from the early church move to the Christendom move, where these people were marginalized and where they were under their environment, but they were totally relying on heaven and the, the life of heaven was being lived through them. But then when Constantine took it and set them up in the middle of town, they began to trust other things for their life and influence. And they could trust state power for their influence, dominance, and privilege. And we have been able to borrow that for our privilege and influence until about the 60s. And so I think the church, to answer all of this, is in a bit of an identity crisis right now. We're just trying to figure out how to be influential. And um, it's not pretty, you know? I think what we're, what we're learning is that our, our grabbing for political power is not becoming of us. And this is, I'm not, I'm not trying to make a comment about any particular candidate. I'm trying to talk about what is happening is that the root of our hope and confidence where it lies is being exposed right now. And we have not been a disciple making enterprise where we're going the, the way we change culture and society lies within our, our individual responsibility to be that where we are and where we live. We keep trying to legislate it out of our lives or into, you know, we keep trying to vote our, our, our influence into the world. And we should. I mean, we should try to do that as much as we take responsibility for what we want to see happen in the world through the life that we have, the one that we're living. And that happens, and that comes into reality as we make disciples that make disciples that make disciples. Jesus told us that we're a little bit of yeast, and a little bit of yeast fills the whole dough. And we actually are to be a change agent, but not by power. You know, it's not by power. It's not by might. It's by his spirit. And so it's his spirit working through each of our lives individually. And the identity crisis is not knowing how to be the people of God. And so um, I just think that what's happening right now is that uh, – We'll continue to grab for it until we listen again to heaven and say, tell us again who we are and help us, help us pick up our, our responsibility to be who you've called us to be out in the wild, you know, out in the wild, on the street level of, of humanity. So yeah, that might be a little bit nerdy or provocative or, or, or whatever, but um, in there is this, um, germ of an idea uh, that the world is dying to see authentic followers of Jesus more than they're desiring to see people who religiously claim to be Christians. Yes, I totally, totally agree. And I think uh, you said something so beautifully that things aren't really going to change until we say, tell us again who we are in you. That's right. You know, and I think that's really, really beautiful. So with that, um, what's giving you hope right now? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Well, I, you know, the, the conversation. So, so I was at a retreat this last week and, I, and I, you know, Joe Saxon, who's a friend of both of ours, you know, she was teaching and she did this just real small little teaching on growth. And, she just said that uh, she, she threw up this little video. It was about a 30 second video of a seed that was growing in some soil. And that it was like this time lapse thing. The seed was growing very quickly, obviously. And it grew and it broke as it was growing. It broke. 
in, in its growing process. And her whole word was growth requires some breaking. And we keep trying to minimize the breaking, you know, because we hate it. We hate the breaking. We hate what it feels like to, to, to go through that kind of breaking. But I think that what's happening right now is there is kind of a breaking, you know, and, and it, even if it's the conversation, even if it's just a hard conversation, we're having hard conversations around race right now, you know, man, we should just have hard conversations. Uh, just have them, you know, let a breaking happen. Like, like, like I'm praying that I would be broken in in that regard, you know, we're having all kinds of gender conversations and, and you know, sexual orientation conversations, wherever we land on that stuff, the, the conversation itself is a breaking, you know, we're having all these political conversations. All of this stuff is this, is this breaking that is happening. And I think what we can do is we can just cling tight to Jesus and just let, let him, let him navigate our way through. Like just, even if we disagree, you know, even if we disagree, like, and we will, we will absolutely disagree. The family of God will disagree across the spectrum of these things. But somewhere in it is a midline. And that midline, I think, is going to be an awakening. I think it's going to be an awakening where people turn back to Jesus being their hope. And I'm really hoping that his narrative, that's what I see happening. I keep seeing a Jesus narrative emerge that is I'm just so excited about it. I'm, I'm really excited about this idea. People examining the life of Jesus and going, what would he do right now if he had my life to live? And uh, I, I think that that's emerging as a, as something that gets me excited. I'm, I'm hopeful about that. As hard as it is, as hard as it is, I'm, I'm hopeful, you know, around that. It's going to take a long, long time, but but uh, I'm I'm in it for that long haul. I love that that hope, that idea. You know. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's really great. Well, I won't take much more of your time. But is there any last thoughts that you want to kind of share with our uh, friends who may be watching? Hmm. Oh man, if you're if you're a friend, is this a video? By the way, this is a video. <laughs> You look good. <laughs> I would have waved my arms less. Oh, man. Oh, goodness. <laughs> okay. Hey, since this is the video, this is great. This is my parting word right here. If you are watching this, you're watching this because you love Janae Weinbrenner, put your hand in there. Put your hand if you love Janae Weinbrenner. She is lovely. And we should throw all of our weight behind her. We love her so much. Don't we? I do. I love you. I'm really grateful to be with you today. Oh, John, thanks so much. I really appreciate you. And I can't wait to see what happens out of Love and War and all the good things that are going to be coming down the pike. So thank you. You bet. You bet.